the hidden Baconian acrostics and anagrams in the Shakespeare First Folio. In recent times, a very substantial body of academic literature has been produced by critics and commentators surrounding the subject of Shakespeare and anagrams. In the words of Professor Fowler in his own influential Literary Names, Personal Names in English Literature, Shakespeare's many anagrams in the sonnets were lost from view for centuries until R. H. Winnick's closely argued article in 2009 startled the scholarly world wherein he revealed embedded letter anagrams on Risley. Winnick, in turn, acknowledges the work of Helen Wendler, The Art of Shakespeare's Sonnets, which proved key to establishing that the sonnets contain numerous instances of anagrammatic wit, of which Winnick provides several examples. There are, Dr Winnick states, more than a dozen sonnets, those addressed to or about the unnamed, narcissistic, androgynously beautiful fair friend, that contain short, semantically discreet phrases, most not more than a dozen or so characters long, in which occur the letters needed to form the name Rithesley, with few or none missing or left over. Professor Sofer points out that Ben Johnson, who was living with Bacon at Gorhambury, assisting him with the translations of his essays, while the Shakespeare First Folio was working its way through the Jaggard printing press, in his prefaces to Volpone and the Alchemist, employed acrostic verse poems that summarise the plots. In addition to this, Professor Sofer provides a short list of 16th and 17th century poets who employed acrostic devices. Thomas Wyatt, Thomas Watson, John Salisbury, Edmund Spencer, Joshua Sylvester, John Donne, John Cleveland, George Herbert, who also assisted Bacon with his translation of De Augmentis, and John Milton, author of a mysterious verse printed in the Shakespeare Second Folio. The impact of Winnick's article on anagrams and Shakespeare's sonnets that had apparently so startled the scholarly world was far exceeded a few, few years later when William Bellamy set forth his groundbreaking work, Shakespeare's Verbal Art. The important study reveals and explores the anagrammatic devices that lie beneath the surface of all Shakespearean texts and how these subtextual devices help to clarify authorial intention and meaning. As exemplar texts, he focuses especially on the sonnets and the plays Hamlet, Othello and Twelfth Night, all of which are written and constructed around various concealed anagrams and other related linguistic and cryptic devices. This is a book about Shakespeare's virtuosity in the art of anagram. It aims to show how Shakespeare, the greatest poet of his age, may prove also the greatest anagrammatist. As will become clear in later chapters, a conventionally subtextual anagram anagrammatism is not only pervasive in Shakespeare's verse, but is fundamental to his verbal art. In Elizabethan England, writes Professor Fowler, four influential poets practised embedding of name anagrams, three of whom were Sidney, Spencer and Shakespeare. He produces several examples of embedded name anagrams identified by Dr Winnick in the Shakespeare sonnets before concluding, Shakespeare, the greatest poet of his age, may prove also the greatest anagrammatist. He was undoubtedly the greatest poet and dramatist of his age or of any age, and he was also its greatest literary cryptographer inserting hidden acrostics and anagrams in the Shakespeare First Folio, repeatedly revealing and confirming his authorship of the greatest literature in the history of the world. In the First Folio, in The Life and Death of King John, Bacon explores the law of bastardy, in particular royal bastardy, through the most important and largest role in the play, the royal bastard Sir Philip Falconbridge. The first eight letters of the surname Falconbridge conceals within it an anagram of F. Bacon. 
In a scene with the royal bastard Sir Philip Falconbridge, our concealed author inserts, reading upwards, the anagram, I am Francis Bacon. In The Taming of the Shrew, our supreme concealed poet and dramatist inserts two anagrams, F. Bacon and Bacon. The early Roman tragedy Titus Andronicus, with its complex Baconian legal themes and the complicated distinctions around private and public revenge, the subject of his essay of revenge, includes a similar anagram of Bacon. Over Christmas 1594, Bacon organised and directed the magnificent Christmas grazing revels that premiered his Shakespeare legal play, The Comedy of Errors. On the grand night of the 20th of December, a great presence of lords, ladies and worship, worshipful personages gathered for its performance in the hall to see to the premiere of the play with its themes of errors and confusions lately greatly expanded upon by Bacon in The Advancement of Learning. In the opening scene, Bacon leaves his secret signature in the way of the following anagrams of Francis Bacon. During the late 1580s and early 1590s, Bacon began writing the War of the Roses plays, 1 Henry VI, 2 Henry VI, 3 Henry VI and Richard III, otherwise known as the first Shakespeare tetralogy. In the first folio, in the fifth act of 1 Henry VI, he inserts a triple anagram in a single passage. Bacon, Bacon, Bacon. Again, in the fourth act of 2 Henry VI, Bacon incorporates the following anagram of F. Bacon. In Richard II, Bacon incorporates the simply astonishing anagram, by one Bacon. In the first folio, in Act 1, Scene 1 of the first part of King Henry IV, Bacon secretly signs it with the acrostic F. Baco and the anagram F. Bacon. Two further anagrams of F. Bacon appear in Much Ado About Nothing. Moving from the Shakespeare English history plays to his classical Roman history tragedy, The Life and Death of Julius Caesar, a supreme philosopher poet adroitly inserts several of his secret signatures in the form of the anagrams Bacon and F. Bacon. The incomparable tragedy of Hamlet, whose central figure is the disguised dramatic portrait of its concealed author, there is also inserted an anagram of F. Bacon. The complex Shakespeare play Measure for Measure has at its heart the godlike Rosicrucian figure of Duke Vincentio, one akin to Prospero in The Tempest. He is seen by many Shakespeare scholars as surrogate of the poet-dramatist himself made in, in his own image. Or, put another way, the secretive, complex and enigmatic character of Duke Vincentio, who adopts multiple masks, disguises and identities in Measure for Measure, represents Shakespeare. That is, to, that is to say the true author of the play Bacon, who, outside of the play, also adopts multiple identities and disguises behind his living masks, including the pseudonym of Shakespeare. This play is marked by a concealed author with his anagram F. Bacon. The Tragedy of Othello, written in 1604, first appeared in print in a quarter edition in 1622, with another version of Othello appearing the next year in the 1623 Shakespeare First Folio. Astonishingly, a comparative examination of the 1622 quarter edition and the version of Othello in the first folio reveals that the latter is 160 lines longer and differs in wording in more than a thousand instances. 
Of course, the secret author of Othello was still very much alive in 1622 and 1623, which surely to any rational person is of some critical importance, whose mortality is conveniently evidenced in the hidden anagram of his name, Bacon. The true chronicle history of the life and death of King Lear and his three daughters first appeared in a quarto edition in 1608, and just over a decade later in one of the falsely dated Pavier Jagard quarto editions in 1619. A third version of King Lear appeared in the 1623 first folio, which was subjected to substantial revision, cutting some 300 lines from the first quarto and adding around 100 new lines to the folio version, with several speeches differently assigned, as well as numerous variations in language and wording. A sublime dramatist also inserted his secret signatures here in the form of two anagrams of Bacon. The other great tragedy, Macbeth, written in 1606, was first printed in the 1623 Shakespeare First Folio with the following hidden anagram of Bacon secretly inserted into its text. The Roman history play Coriolanus, first written around 1608, was first printed in the 1623 Shakespeare First Folio and was also adorned with an anagram of Bacon. The late play The Winter's Tale, which explored the political process of the Union of England and Scotland, reflected in a series of speeches and treaties written by Bacon in the years leading up to its composition, was first printed in the 1623 Shakespeare First Folio, with the following Baco acrostic and anagram of Bacon. In Cymbeline, King of Britain, first printed in the 1623 first folio, placed at the last of the tragedies, the final drama in the volume, Bacon conceals and reveals himself several times in one line in Act 2, Scene 5, where Posthumus refers to the false boast of Giacomo. The above is a very condensed and involved allusion to its author, Bacon. The name Bacon is of Germanic origin, a boar is a wild pig from which bacon is derived, and for good measure, acorn phonetically sounds like bacon. And with the initial letter from the next word, boar, it yields the anagram bacon. And when we add the letter F from the word full, the anagram F bacon. The date when Timon of Athens, whose eponymous character is a disguised dramatic portrait of Bacon, was written and revised is uncertain. Some aspects of the play reflect circumstances and themes beyond Bacon's fall in 1621. The play was first entered into the Stationers' Register in 1623 and printed for the first time in the first folio with the anagram F. Bacon. Francis Bacon Shakespeare was undoubtedly the greatest poet and dramatist of his age, of all time, who possessed a profound grasp of ciphers, codes, rebuses, emblems, symbolic head and tail pieces, and all other cryptic devices, and undoubtedly the greatest authorial anagrammatist, evidence of which is repeatedly and continually found throughout the first folio, revealing and confirming that Bacon is Shakespeare. <laughs>